Arunava. All good, but all of this, uh, the enormous transition needs a lot of money. Okay, and there's also geopolitics involved, including the one word that gets everyone to sit up a little straighter, which is China. So can you give us a sense of the kind of financial challenges that such a transition is going to take and the geopolitical uh, challenges of making that happen? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mridula. And you left yourself out in you know, uh, pointing out to Malcolm, Sumanth and myself, but your own work, your own writings, but your own actions are very much part of the solution set. But thank you also to JLF for naming this panel with, after Suman's book, Fossil Free, and my book, Energizing India. So thank, it's great to be in this conversation. Um, you started the question by saying all good. Yes, I mean, all good in the sense that Suman highlighted the church is, the, the tent is becoming bigger. We need a broader church within which we can all participate. But what's not clear right now is what are these different pathways through which individual companies or countries or groups of countries are going to act. So setting a target, whether you're trying to limit to 1.5 or 2 or 2.5 is one thing. Getting it done is a different thing altogether. Right? So in the getting it done stuff, I put it as a money, materials, and manpower challenge. Right? Uh, so let's start with money in the first case. India alone, this decade, we'll need to invest at least $200 billion in clean energy infrastructure alone. If you look at its electric vehicle ambitions, that is another market of about $206 billion. If you look at its green hydrogen targets, that's another investment opportunity of about $100 to $140 billion. Add it all up, uh, India's offering an investment opportunity of over half a trillion dollars of investments this decade alone. But on the flip side, you've got to ask how much is actually flowing into India. So notwithstanding the, the, the human service that Renew and others are doing, in total, we are attracting you know, anywhere between 15 to 18 billion dollars annually. Now we need to up that game at least 2x, 3x perhaps every year for every year until the remainder of this decade. Compare that to the rest of the world, right? Uh, the bulk of capital is still circulating in capital-rich regions. Now, I at least originally studied as an economist, and my econ professor told me there's law of supply and demand, but the next thing is that capital flows from capital-rich to capital-poor regions, and labor goes in the other direction. So. I want my university fees back because capital is circulating in the capital-rich regions. Now that's happening for reasons of risk, etc. But the point is it highlights that where the sun shines the most, that's not where money is flowing. So if we care about India's energy transition, if we care about the growth of Indian companies in this sector, and if we care about the planet, it's a, it is the single most important thing we've got to solve for in trying to bring capital into this. how will we get right? the money in? Now, one of the ways to do this is, of course, to have clearer and longer term and unchangeable policies where there's no backtracking, no stress that this policy direction will change. And more importantly, that if you're signing a contract, you're going to get paid. Right? There are ways to de-risk that as well. And I think one of the institutional innovations that India did in creating the Solar Energy Corporation of India was something that many other countries had not done, which did reduce a degree of the risk that entrepreneurs faced by absorbing that risk and keeping the discount separate. But there's more to be done. There's macroeconomic risk that's not in the hands of an individual entrepreneur. So if the US Fed raises interest rates, then dollar-denominated debt taken by an Indian company, the cost of that finance goes up. Nothing has changed here. The policy hasn't changed. The entrepreneur hasn't changed. The land banks haven't changed. Nothing has changed except your cost of finance has gone up, which is why under India's G20 presidency, a lot of focus was on how do you reform the multilateral development banks to be bigger, bolder, and better in dealing with these macroeconomic risks. But very quickly, there are those two other challenges as well, not just the money part, because 
uh, we can count the trillions. We need maybe 5.96 trillion dollars, but there's over 200 trillion dollars of institutional capital sitting in the world. So that's 2%. So it's about finding the right incentives. So there is other, there are other bottlenecks that are actually also quite real. The materials part, right? Uh, India today is importing well over 80% of its solar panels. 92% of those are coming from China and Hong Kong. I mean, if India goes from about 70 gigawatts of solar to say 200, 250 gigawatts of solar, another 150 or 200 gigawatts of wind, Overall, about 500 gigs of non-fossil capacity by the end of the decade. You've got to ask yourself, will this level of dependence give comfort to a policymaker or to a politician? So it makes sense to start thinking about the global value chain in clean energy products and services. Um, what we've seen is that over the past decade, as countries have become more ambitious about clean energy, their dependence has grown from, for solar from less than 40 countries to over 70 countries, for lithium bio batteries from 19 to 48. So a number of countries across the world are worried about this. And finally on manpower, we estimate that we need at least a million people in the workforce just for our 2030 targets. But there's a potential for over 60 million jobs to be created in the broader sustainability paradigm for India. So whether you are an entrepreneur, an investor, uh, a critical minerals miner, or an educationist, the church and the tent is widening. You just got to come and participate.